This week, the government will announce a £150 million programme to help relieve youth unemployment. But this package will bring no immediate benefit to the 600,000 youngsters leaving school this year. More than a third of them will still be looking for jobs in three months' time. Last month, a report to the government showed that unemployment amongst young people had risen three times faster than for other groups and that no real improvement could be expected over the next few years. Tonight, World in Action reports from one of the worst-hit areas, Liverpool, on the problem of school leavers on the dole. Karen Gill has lots of time to practice the organ. She left school last year with six passes in a certificate of education. She's still on the dole. I left school last year, thinking that I could find a job with ease. I haven't found a job. I've been un unemployed for the last five, six months, and I've tried my hardest. I've got six CSEs, but that doesn't get you anywhere. And if it did, I'd have a job now. This month, Karen will be joined by thousands more school leavers starting on the dole. When you're on the bus going after a job or going to the job centre, you think it might be a lucky day. You think you might um, find, find something that everyone else has overlooked. You never do. On Monday when I was going down the job centre, the girls and lads that left this year, they were all going the careers, and I thought, you know, they're out, out on the jail, you know, unemployed. And it's very hard to find a job. Even if you've been to a good school and got a few qualifications, it's still very hard, especially if you've no experience at all. When we're at school, the teachers say it will be hard for you to get a job, but you don't believe them. You can't believe them because you think, you know, well, I can do this and I can do that, but, you know, when you get to the matter of fact of the job, you can't do it because there's that many people after that one job. They only want the best. They don't want uh, someone who's a good driver. They want the best. So you're left standing. The headmaster of Karen's old school, Mr John Morgan. I would expect all of our children to find it difficult to get employment straight from school. Where before, school records at the end of a school career could be pretty well guaranteed, if they were good, to get somebody a job. Now the situation is that even with very good school records, the most that school records can hope to do is help towards getting a job. Never a guarantee anymore. And if those records are not outstanding, the chances of being snapped up by an employer are very, very slim. I would really like to work, even, even though it wouldn't be for much, but I'd still like to work, because it's an experience more than anything else, to work, to, to be part of a team. Because even if you're only in a factory, you're part of a team. And, and I suppose that would be good because it, it strengthens your, um, yourself, your morale, everything about you. But when you're on the jail, you just, you feel as if, you know, you're wasting everyone's time and money and you're living off other people's taxes, which is what you're doing. So you take a low paid job, even though it almost costs you money to do it, simply to have a job? Yes, simply to have a job. Well, you, you couldn't get any lower than the £9 a week that I'm getting. So, what, £13, £14? That, that would be OK. I would work for that. Eddie Pinder is a year younger than Karen. He left school this Easter, and he's already facing difficulty in his own search for work. Well, the first interview we got was, I can think I can remember, it was a shop, shop assistant. And you didn't need any qualifications. So I went down, went and sat down. A girl came out of the office and said, um, Mr. So and so will see you. I can't remember his name. Um, so I went in and I sat down and he interviewed me. He asked me, um, Did they have any qualifications? Even though he didn't need them, he asked. And I said, No. So he goes, um, Have you got any references? So he said, I've got my school testimonial. So he goes, can I have a look at it? So I took it out and showed him, and he said, it's a very good testimony. Um, so he asked me if I had a phone, and I said no, and he goes, well, the only way we can let you know is through the post, and that'll be within the next four days. 
So I just left that, went home, had something to eat, then went after the second job, and I got no reply from that one either. So how does it make you feel when you don't get replies from interviews? Well, it makes me feel downhearted and depressed. Um, you know, going three interviews a day, and you come back, and you, you've been out in your suit all day in the, in the hot weather, like, and uh, you just come in, throw your jacket off, sit down, your dad's got a cup of tea ready for you, you know. And you just, you're out again the next day to Elm's house and go after another couple of jobs. How do you feel about being on the dole? I feel terrible about it because um, the only reason I feel bad about taking is taking the money because um, I know it's people that are working hard and it's the taxpayers' money. And I don't like taking the taxpayers' money. I want to be independent and work for myself. Why is it you feel so strongly about getting a job? Because when I was young, um, my mum didn't, my mum didn't work because she she was always sort of ill, and um, my dad ne never had a really sort of good job, you know. We always on, my dad was always on poor wages, and uh, but we always got through, you know. My mum would always make sure there was food in the house, and we had clothes and were clean going to school and all that. So when I weighed it all up, when I was about. You know, 15, I thought about it and said, well, if they can do all this for me while I'm young, I want to repay them back some way. So that's why, what it, that's the reason what's made me, made me so determined to get a job, to pay my mum back in some sort of way. To get the latest information on job vacancies, Eddie visits the school's career service every morning. In the afternoons, he often calls in at the job centre to see if there's anything on their notice boards that he could do and then he reports back to the staff on the jobs they've already sent him for. How did you get on at the interview I sent you to last week? The camera shop one? Mm. Oh, well, it's, the manager of the shop talked to me. Yeah. He was busy, you know. He was, mm -hmm. and I could tell he was trying to get rid of me. Like, so uh, he just talked to me very briefly and said, told me what, the sort of, so, what sort of work I'd be doing, mm -hmm. how much money I'd be getting. Yeah. And he just said, you're not on the phone, so I'll write to you and within the next four days and let you know. You You've not heard anything from No, I haven't heard. No. It definitely sounds work you want. Would you consider any other type of work? I just want something to, to get some money. No, a mm -hmm. job to get some money and to help out. To help, help out the family home, at home. Mm -hmm. So really, too, you're looking for a job with more money, mm -hmm. more certain <laughs> prospects. This is what you mean. Yeah, but I'd have to like it, you know, to stick it. Karen hasn't visited the local careers office for a couple of months because she thinks it's a waste of time. But today she's come with her father, who's upset because no one has found her a job. He wants to talk to Leslie Roberts, the man who runs the local office. When we made arrangements to film this visit, Les Coglin, head of the Liverpool Careers Advisory Service, offered to join the discussion. They started by talking about the many further education courses open to Karen and young people like her. But what she really wants is a job. Regardless of what we've been talking about up to now about further education, the point now that Karen is still unemployed now. Yes. And she's looked, she's searched for jobs. Yes. Now, this is the main thing at the moment. Yes. The longer she's out of her job, like all the other children about, the deeper she's going to get into a rut. Quite agree. Now, we've got people with possibly better qualifications and can, who still can't get a job. This is any job. Now, where, are, where do we go to from there? We've had young people coming in here almost daily. And these people who are at us, like terriers every day, these are the people who are being fixed up, one here, two there, three there, perhaps. You have to be persistent. In the past three days, We've had 981. That's a fair figure already in three days of youngsters coming to see us after leaving school. I've shown the hair how many you've provided jobs for rather than how many have come in to see you. How many out of that 900 have you found jobs for? This is, this is what we're here for. A small number, but I've only been able to help those people for whom there was a job here. It would be lovely to have 981 jobs on the counter when they come Just in. Just a fair percentage would have been a satisfactory answer to me, but obviously you haven't given me that answer. Well, can I put it this way? I wouldn't know exactly what our current registry is because it leapt up this week uh, you know, with the school leaving um, occasion since last Friday. I would guess in terms of the city as a whole, 
that when we get to August, which is always our peak month for, for numbers, that I'll be faced with something like 7,000 youngsters, a lot of them school leavers this year. Um, how many vacancies there will be in between, impossible to say. All I can tell you is that when I went to check the other day, with a register probably in the region of 4,000 at the moment, um, there were 51 vacancies. You've just quoted now as 51 vacancies for 4,000. Yeah, on that day. But you still want these children to come running down here knowing that 4,000 of them and there's five, 51 vacancies. I think it is important that they and we are as active as possible. I'm not at, in all attempting, I think, to shirk our responsibilities. It's a situation, quite frankly, I'm getting near, as you probably guess, towards the end of my working life, and I'm only so unhappy to think it's the worst situation I've known in, in the whole time I've been in this service. And quite frankly, I get very angry about it. Well, can't you understand the way I'm concerned about I'm pa Karen's father, not in, everyone else's father? Indeed, I understand perfectly. And I can well understand, you know, you feel you, you complain and so on. Would to God we had more power. We can make nobody do anything. The teachers in school always used to say, first impression is very important wherever you go. So um, I thought, why not wear a suit for, a, for an interview for a job, you see? Because um, it gives you a nice sort of appearance, doesn't it? It makes them think that, you, you know, you're really interested in where. The job centre have given Eddie a number to ring at eight in the evening for a labouring job, but he's decided to turn up in person to improve his chances. Hello. I'm from the job centre. Um, I was wondering if the vacancy for the labourer was still open. I see. Uh, well, it's only about 20 minutes ago that I decided, because I've had about four or five applications and I've interviewed the lads, and uh, as I say, it's just gone. So it's unfortunate. Oh. Okay? Yes. Well, thanks very much for coming. Okay? Thanks a lot. That's all. The reason why I don't feel like giving up is because I've been at it since I've left school, six weeks. I, I admit I'm depressed sometimes when I come home, but that doesn't make me really downhearted. Like, and I keep in the back of my mind what my mum and dad have done for me while I was young, and I just want to repay them back. So that's my determination in getting a job. So I'm, I don't think I will give up until I find one. How does it feel not to have a job? <laughs> Terrible. You know, because I get up of uh, the morning at 8 o'clock, take the baby to school, come back, then I've got nothing to do unless there's a bit of painting or something to repair around the house, you know. And then I'd repair that, then I'd have nothing else to do because the rest, you know, my mum tidies up and all that, but if she ever wants a hand, I'll help her. Instead of sitting there watching the telly. But, um, you know, there's just... I feel bad about not being employed because it's too boring sitting around the house. And there's nothing really... There's no sort of recreation for um, me to go to of a night except play football. You know, there's not a, a youth club close by or anything like that. And how many jobs have you been after altogether now? Well, from the job centre, I've been sent to with job cards after about 12. And f on my own accord, like, looking round, asking in shops, I've been after about 15. So altogether, that's about, you know, that's a f quite a few jobs, isn't it? 27 jobs. It doesn't seem that many, you know, because I'm doing, say, three and four a day. And when I've, run, when I've used the cards up, at the interviews, well, I'm out on my own then. You know, I'm going around Owen Owens and places like that in town asking if they want anybody in the display department or something like that. I just say, give me any job that you've got. But there's you no know, nothing. So just come back home as empty as I went out. But a bit more depressed. With more than 200,000 teenagers already on the dole, the prospects for Karen and Eddie are grim. And the picture would be much worse if it wasn't for more than 60,000 artificial jobs which have been created with government money. The boys here are on one of these job creation projects. They're paid a proper wage for the work they do, but are forced to leave these jobs after 52 weeks. 
One of the first job creation projects in Liverpool was started by the Old Swan Boys Club. The club has created work for more than a hundred boys using nearly three quarters of a million pounds of government money channeled through the Manpower Services Commission. Lewis Edwards is the club warden. What sort of projects can get uh, Manpower Services funding? Uh, there's a very wide variety. I think the brief is that it must be of benefit to the community, it must be work that wouldn't otherwise be done, and it must be something that's got an end product. I think those are the three main criterions involved. What effect does working on these projects have on the boys who are employed? This has been most interesting and something that I've been watching very, very carefully. To begin with, it's hard to generalise because the boys we have on our schemes, they're from every type of home, they're from many parts of Merseyside, they're different ages, and uh, I can only say this, that the, for a boy who's been out of work for a year or two years, and some of ours have, some have never known jo a job since they left school, and they have become so despondent, they felt that there's really no room for them. It's, it's, it's just not the money, it's the sheer boredom and the frustration. And when the lad in that situation gets a job, the change is electric. One of Lewis Edwards' projects is decorating homes for pensioners and the disabled. We asked two boys working here what they thought about job creation. In nine months I'd say I've learnt more what I'd have learnt at college in about two or three years on an apprenticeship because uh, there's no theory involved. It's just practical. You just go straight through. You know, with your supervisor, teachers, you're all that, you know. And what are the things that you've learned? Well, I'm painting and decorating. I'm confident now that I could go into a room and decorate it and uh, come out and make a good job of it. It's uh, very beneficial in that way. So what difference does making a, being on a job creation make to your life now? No. Well, uh, it's, when I was on the dole, it was very... Uh, you know, couldn't do nothing. Like It was just uh, sitting in the house looking at the paper for jobs. And, but this, it gives you uh, something to do, you know, really aim at. Like, some people have suggested that job creation is, in a way, phony work. It's been sort of created with government money. No, actually, that was definitely wrong, because we work a full day. We do a day's work, and we do as much as what a tradesman would do in a day. So, uh, you know, that's all wrong now. And uh, it's beneficial for the old people, which is mainly what we do, because half of them haven't got the money to get tradesmen in, and we make just as good a job as a tradesman. So it's, you know, it's beneficial to them as well as us. And it's good for the government and all because they're getting the unemployment level down. So, no, I can't see nothing wrong with it. What difference has having this job made to you? The uh, difference it's made is, besides financial, is uh, it, it's given me something to aim for. It's given me something to do, you know, to get up in the morning for. Plus the fact that it's got an awful lot of job satisfaction in it. Why is that? Well. When you've been wallpapered in a room or painting a ceiling, what have you, you, know, you can stand back and say, well, doing something very worthwhile. And, uh, you know, I just feel as though you're doing something positive. Have you got any criticisms of the job creation scheme? The only one is that it should, I think, personally, that it should go on for three years and come out semi-skilled or something. It's the effects of that. Because 12 months, you know, it's just... It's not long enough. One of their friends is already suffering under this 12-month rule. He had to stop work here just before Christmas. Since you finished here, have you had a job? No. I've been looking, but uh, I just can't seem to find any job at all. So has being on this job creation scheme have been of any use to you or help in looking for a job? In help for looking for a job at the moment, it doesn't seem to be any help at all. But Working there has taught me some things which I'm thank you know, enjoy I've learned and thankful for learning like enjoyed learning. So how do you feel about your prospects of getting a job now? The pretty grim, you know. Like everyone else, the grim. It's tired, I've got loads of me too around. Just have to keep pushing, to see if I can get one. This boy's worries were underlined at a second project we visited. Here, other youngsters are employed making toys for disabled children. The supervisor in charge is Janet Guilfoyle. She told us her reservations about the job creation project. JCP is a good idea as a short-term solution. As far as the youngsters working with me are concerned, uh, come September, they'll be 
thrown back on the dole. Maybe some of them for only a few months. How could that be improved? Well, with better training. Um, if JCP was extended so that it covered two or three two or three years instead of 12 months. Would you want that even if it was at the expense of cutting the number of children who could benefit from them? Yes, I think so. Um, even if we only produced a handful of well-qualified, uh, well-trained youngsters, that's better than having hundreds of youngsters who have got no qualifications or training. All job creation projects are due to end before March 1978, but the problem of youth unemployment won't end. The government is urgently considering what needs to be done. Among those in Liverpool, recently consulted by a government select committee, were Professor Ridley, who supervised the spending of £18 million of job creation funds, and two job creation sponsors, Lewis Edwards and David Matthews. So many of the boys and girls we've had, they've not had any work from the time they've left school, and as a result, they've just not got any habit of work. And they're liable to stay in bed to all hours. And the disciplines of a regular job is something that we've given an impression of. They give up trying, and frankly, I don't blame them. What's the use of going to the careers office and the job centre day after day, and then, if they can afford it, a bus ride to an interview, where they'll probably find 30 other people waiting, and they know they've no chance of getting the job, and they give up. And this is the greatest value of job creation. It's done something to help these youngsters. The job creation schemes that we're involved in is providing um, work experience and some training for the people in them at very little cost to the community because a well-run job creation scheme, by the time you knock off from the wages, national insurance costs, the income tax that they begin to pay quite quickly, the actual net cost to the community compared with um, uh, unemployment pay is really remarkably small. We found that basically and tragically the most important training that we've done are literacy courses. Uh, and we found many youngsters who have come to us and can't even sign their name for a receipt for their wages. So uh, if only we could have them for longer, we could not only make them literate, we could then put them on some worthwhile course which would make them much more attractive to a potential employer. Professor Ridley, do you agree that uh, they should be longer than 52 weeks? Well, it's an argument that is put forward on all sides and there's a lot of pressure. Don't forget, however, this purpose of job creation is to provide temporary employment as a transition to normal employment. It isn't the government trying to create new permanent jobs, and the government hasn't got the means to do that. I accept very fully that for many youngsters, one year is not long enough for a period of training. We're now aware that youth unemployment is not a temporary crisis issue, but growingly people realize that youth unemployment, 60 to 18 year old unemployment, will be with us even if we have an economic revival that even if industry booms, very few firms will be taking on large numbers of particularly educationally disadvantaged youngsters. The productivity will come by slimming down labor forces, not by taking on more. So we have to think of what 16 to 18 year olds can usefully do to their own benefit and to the community's benefit. As things stand at the moment, what are the prospects for the young people we've been talking to? Well, it sounds as if I'm a prophet of gloom, but I don't think they're very good. The Holland Committee, which looked in the problems of youth employment, said that it thought the problems were probably structural. That means they won't go away with rising productivity or with a revived economy. And that for 10 years, they said, uh, youth unemployment will not be reduced to acceptable levels. And that will be uh, a very tragic situation. And what will happen then? Well, it's a bit like in the old days of the Luddites, when machinery was invented and workers thought they would become unemployed and they smashed the machine. Yeah. And youngsters are going to see the same sort of thing, I think. And sooner or later, we will have to rethink um, our working patterns. There's already talk, shorter working weeks for adults, so that instead of adult workers doing overtime, they should spread the work around. We may have to rethink about women, married women being employed, and we may have to think about youngsters not going into normal employment as a rule until much later than at present, doing other useful things. And this means thinking about society and its purpose again. Yes, unfortunately, Professor Ridley is quite right. The future is grim indeed. And seen in the eyes of these youngsters, we can already see the despair. David and I often sit in court and we have to deal with many of these youngsters and we see what this leads to. And we suspect there are many parts of the country where people just don't realize the urgency, the tragedy 
that is facing these young people. And unless somebody does something about it, and I don't know who can do it except the government, by creating some sort of opportunities for service, for training, for education, something that is not only sounds good on paper, but something that is acceptable to these youngsters. And they're not all little angels, let's be honest. They're, they're a very mixed bag, but they deserve an opportunity. They deserve a chance to make something of their lives. And if we just let them stagnate, society's going to have a lot to answer for throughout the country as a whole, and I think this is the important message. Thank you.